<laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi. Thanks, Douglas. That was uh, sweet. Thank you. <clears throat> when, um, when I was asked to come and uh, talk here, I thought, what in the world can I tell such bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, informed, I mean, I'm assuming there's not a Monsanto plant in the audience. Um, <laughs> what, can, what could I possibly tell them that's new, that's, that's, that's I mean, you guys read, you're, you, you, know, you travel, you buy local, you're in your kitchens, I'm assuming. Uh, what can I tell them that's new? And so something that I've been working on, so, so this, is, this is brand new this evening, okay? Something I've been working on the last several years is how do you know? Uh, customers always ask us, um, how do you know if a food system is right or wrong? See, I actually believe there's, there's, there's righteous things and evil things. I actually believe that. It's not just, you know, a hodgepodge of things. Um, and so gradually I developed a, a kind of list of what are the, um, what are the consistent aspects of what I call truth, you know, truth in farming, truth in food. I call these benchmarks of truth. Now, it's interesting that I'm, uh, you know, I'm addressing you here tonight trying to uh, talk about truth uh, because I'm not sure just how, um, how current I am. I mean, uh, on the plane coming today, I read uh, an article that said, um, uh, that said now, if you aren't on LinkedIn, you are now invisible. <laughs> so I guess I'm invisible. And then while I'm in the airport waiting for, um, um, you know, and, and, and actually maybe in a day with surveillance cameras and drones everywhere, it's good to be invisible. And then I'm sitting in the airport and two young people are sitting next to me, you know, and they're uh, talking about their phones. and They've got their new eyes, whatever, sixes or something like that. And, um, and one of them was mentioning their history and, and said something about flip, flip phones. And, and the other one says, well, they don't even count. And so I quickly put my flip phone away. <laughs> and um, so I'm invisible and uh, my phone doesn't count. I guess I'm soon going to be uh, obsolete. And so um, maybe I can speed up the process by being invisible and a cell phone. But, you know, this, this, we don't talk about truth much anymore. We, everything is a sound bite. It's a, it's, um, uh, I, I, you know, as a wordsmith, I spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to capture. And I so much appreciate this work. You're trying to capture more meaning out of words. And what are they? And so, um, so I'd like to go through what I call these benchmarks of truth to help us all understand and articulate the commonalities, what's common about a, a truthful uh, food system or a truthful farming system. So here we go. Here we go. Bear with me here. Number one, it should build carbon. Some of these are going to be really, really simple. In fact, I'm a very simple person. I, you know, I work in the soil. I make compost. I got, you know, calluses and splinters. I'm a very simple person, actually. So these won't be um, uh, big, amazing things. But it should build carbon. Does it build soil or de deplete soil? Does it actually build carbon or deplete carbon? How do we deplete carbon? Well, we do it primarily with tillage. We do it, we do it you know, with annuals. Um, nature's system to build carbon is using perennials. So obviously a truthful uh, food and farming system should be one that's, that's primarily pushing us, uh, pushing, I'm not saying annuals are wrong, I'm just saying pushing us toward perennials rather than annuals. And when, when you realize that the uh, whole U.S. duh, I don't, I don't have the uh, respect to call it the U.S. I call it U.S. duh. Um, <laughs> That, that the whole uh, USD, uh, D, uh, see, I can't, I can't even say it. Um, uh, crop insurance and subsidy program helps to create unfair advantages for six crops, all of which are annuals. 
not perennials. You realize how untruthful the, the very, very predication of our system is. That it's, it's, it's predicated on a carbon depleting system. Historically, carbon was always built with perennials and we're still mining perennials. Uh, it's very dear to my heart because I know that our farm uh, 400 years ago had three more feet of topsoil on it than it does today. And when we came, we didn't even have enough soil in 1961 to hold up electric fence stakes. So Dad had to pour concrete in car tires, and we and and my brother and I were little kids. We you know uh, pushed these things off and had a, uh, a half inch pipe and put electric fence stakes down in them. That's how we made electric fence because we didn't have enough soil to hold up electric fence stakes. Carbon building requires integrated systems, not segregated systems. Today, you know, we, we send our troops to the Middle East to get cheap fuel so we can make cheap fertilizer over here to fertilize the, the, the ground over here that's growing grain from over here, run with ma machines that are made over here to grow uh, uh, grain to feed cows that are over here so their manure can go over there and uh, and the, the meat can be processed over here to be shipped over there so the people can eat it over here and their poop goes somewhere else too. I mean, the whole thing, the whole thing is completely segregated rather than integrated. And so when we look at carbon building systems, they're always assuming integrated, not segregated, closed loop cycles, on-site cycling, uh, where these things uh, move around on-site. Think about uh, another carbon uh, building system is pruning. Um, you know, keep carbon young and vibrant. Uh, don't let carbon get old and diseased and go up in fire, but keep, you know, um, cut diseased and old trees and use it for lumber or chip it into, into chips for compost. Um, you know, we can eliminate fire by doing carbon-centric composting. We can, you know, we can graze the, the grass. The, the pruning is like, you know, pruning a vineyard, what we call on our farm, we call mob stocking, herbivorous solar conversion, lignified carbon sequestration, fertilization. And... <laughs> And on our farm since 1961, we've gone from an average of 1% organic matter to today an average of 8% organic matter. All we have to do nationwide is go is increase 1% organic matter. We've gone from 1 to 8, but all we have to do is produce is increase 1% and we would sequester all the carbon that's been submitted, uh, that's been um, uh, lost during the beginning of the industrial age. So, you know, it's not that difficult, but it does mean we have to build carbon and, and, and pruning uh, with grazing, with with. Uh, with good forestry practices to keep good, vibrant, young biomass uh, going where it doesn't go into senescence is critical to build carbon. You know, I understand that some of these things of, of you know, of, of grazing and, and, and cutting trees and that sort of thing uh, makes some of us get a little bit apoplectic. But the fact is that we, uh, that we have to participate. You see, you know, I, un I get that today, you know, we have this, this, this burden on our back, you know, this big, this big burden of, of, it's called guilt, you know, from where we've um, pillaged and raped and been, a, uh, been conquistadors civilizationally for a long time. The study of civilization is the study of soil depletion, carbon depletion. Uh, as, as, Sir Albert had, it's the, as Sir Albert Howard said, it's the temptation of every generation to take what nature took a thousand years to build and turn it into cash in one generation. And so I get the guilt, and but but the the answer is not to say, oh oh oh, I'm I'm you know I'm so um, I'm so sorry about this that uh, that we'll just we'll just abandon nature, you know we uh, I, I it's too sacred to touch, and so we the only way to to integrate my life with nature is to is to lock it up in parks and, and wilderness areas and 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 make sure that it never gets desecrated by human breath. I propose something different. I propose a participatory remediation where we take our big brains and opposing thumbs and we bring our intellectual and mechanical ability to our ecological womb as a masseuse <laughs> to remediate 
all of the pillaging, the rape, and the death, and the destruction that our ancestors have done. So the strategic use of even something like petroleum for chipping to make composting, for building dams, for hydrating the landscape, for turning plastic into solariums for the south side of every single house and building in the northern hemisphere, you know, those kinds of things would be a, a proper use of this bonanza of petroleum to leave a legacy of remediation and healed planet for our children. Number two, I started late, didn't I? I started a little bit late. All right. Number two, benchmark of truth. We got carbon building. Got it? Number two, child friendly. A truthful farm, a truthful food system should be one that is inviting to children. It doesn't take much time on a Tyson chicken farm or a chicken factory or a Smithfield hog factory now owned by the Chinese to realize that it's not a child-friendly place. Child-friendly places are transparent, they're open, they're, they're shareable. They're what I call aesthetically and aromatically sensually romantic. I was in Australia recently and I visited a farm and I saw this sign. It looked like a no trespassing sign. You know, uh, industrial farms are famous for their, you know, razor wire and no trespassing signs. I mean, if you've got, look, if you've got to put on a hazmat suit and walk through sheep dip to go visit your food, you might not want to eat it. But anyway, I walked into this farm and it had like a no trespassing sign, but I got close and I looked and it, it was not a no trespassing sign. The sign said, trespassers will be impressed. That's cool. That's cool. So our farm should be friendly for visitors to participate and learn. Uh, a benchmark of truth is, um, you know, that a farm should be an inviting place for visitors to come. We have a 24-7, 365 open door policy on our farm. Some of you know that know my politics, know that I'm a Christian, libertarian, environmentalist, capitalist, lunatic farmer. And so my... My libertarianism uh, uh, makes me not want a bunch of regulations, but what I'm willing to give in exchange is 24-7, 365 transparency and open door policy for anyone from the world at any time to come and see anything, anytime, anywhere unannounced. That's my commitment to transparency. Now, if you come at two o'clock, don't wake me up, you know, go on and look, but that's fine. Child friendly for farm kids. You know, the first job in, in, uh, in chicken factory farms, the first job for kids as they get, you know, eight, nine, ten years old is the, is the dead walk. Go through the house and pick up all the dead chickens. Boy, isn't that an emotionally enjoyable job? And of course, your friends come out from school and they're all walking around and going, it stinks around here. It should be exciting, it should be uh, child friendly emotionally, an enjoyable place, not embarrassing, not where when you take your school friends around your farm or your buddies, your little buddies, you know, you've got to apologize for this and that and apologize for this stink and that ugly sight and all that. It should be child friendly economically, growing salaries, stacking entrepreneurial enterprises on that farm so that we can actually create salaries for farms and we grow from the inside out. You know, the average child grows up, uh, wants to farm coveting the neighbor's land to, 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 you know, to expand the orchard or expand the dairy or expand the vegetable production or whatever. And what I'm suggesting is that using uh, uh, stacking and, and, and uh, synergistic enterprises, we should be able to grow those additional salaries from the inside out on the existing land base and free up our children children from covetousness. It should be child-friendly ecologically. A farm should be child-friendly ecologically to be a place of mystery, beauty, and awesomeness where you, 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 you go around the corner and there's, a, and there's a wild duck on a clutch of eggs and, and it's a place of mystery and beauty and, and ahas. It should be a place where it's as easy for kids to do meaningful work as it is for adults. Where kids can be productive and not kept isolated from the poison room 
and the lagoon and the places that kill children routinely should be a place that kids can have free roam and free reign and not be afraid they're going to get overcome by carbon monoxide or something. Number three, benchmark of truth, being honoring, being honoring. Yes, I'll say it. It does matter if we promote the pigness of pigs. What I'm suggesting here is that a benchmark of truth is when you walk onto that farm, does it look like the life beings on that farm from the tomato plants to the carrots to the pigs to the farm and their family, does it look like the workers from the bees to the clover are being self-actualized to actually express the full distinctive capacity of their gifts and talents? That's being honoring. You see, we live in a time where the question of does it matter if pigness of pigs occurs is not even asked. The only question is, uh, can we grow them faster, fatter, bigger, cheaper? And we all know that that's not a good goal because you know, that's why the average NFL football player is dead at 57. When your neck is bigger than your head, you're a freak of nature and nature weeds you out. So this even, for, for us, this even filters into how we, how we interact with, with people on the farm. So you know, we, we don't want wages. Uh, we don't like, you know, wages where you just, you know, punch a time clock and you just get paid for your, you know, for your day so much per hour. Rather, what we're creating are instead of employees, we're creating fiefdoms. Doesn't everybody want a fiefdom? Everybody want to be the lord of their castle? Sure. And so instead of, I don't have time to go into to belabor all the things, but, but the point is that rather than bringing on team players, uh, co-laborers that are uh, uh, employees, instead they're, they, they create their own business plans. They create their own fiefdoms. We have memorandums of understanding instead that are just agreements on expectations on polyface, expectations on them, duration of this agreement. And basically they craft their own businesses. Suddenly now I'm not providing jobs. All I have to do is provide a germination tray and vet bright-eyed, bushy-tailed entrepreneurial young people to sprout their, 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 their fit uh, uh, fiefdom that fits with the umbrella and fits on the seed tray. Here's the deal though, it takes time to do that. It takes time to develop and to know the relationships and develop the gifts and talents so that people can exercise their full gifts and talents. That takes time. It can't be just done with a little uh, ad in the newspaper. But the, the result is that we actually have Uh, Instead of a group of questionably loyal people, we have a group of self-actualized, self-respected, self-empowered, autonomous, fiefdom entrepreneurs. And that's cool. That's very cool. Being honoring. All right, number four. Equity is non-physical. Equity is non-physical. The benchmark of truth is that a good farm the, most, the, the equity in the farm should be in management, information, and service, not in infrastructure, and do I dare even say land. Land, as you know, has gone exorbitantly high. And so it's very difficult now for uh, young people to be able to get in. Uh, uh, Douglas already mentioned it. You know, the average farmer is almost 60 years old. I mean, when, when young people can't get into an economic sector of an economy, when young people can't get in, old people can't get out. You know, so, so both generations are stuck. So if we're going to have fluidity, if we're going to have fluidity, what we have, what we have to have is a way to drop the capitalization cost. And one of the ways to do that is to make information management dense farms where the equity is management information and customers. It's all about why, not how, as we developed models that allow us to uh, leverage equity that doesn't have to be borrowed from a bank. 
Number five, innovation is empowered. When you go onto the farm or food system, when you, when you saw these, one of the things that, that, that I couldn't help but thinking as I, of course, I was kind of, you know, running through my head this whole thing, as I was looking at those images, and I'm just looking at incredible innovation, innovation of thought, innovation of practice, uh, innovation of collaboration, innovation of modeling, uh, from, from inventing proper machines and technology to inventing uh, distribution networks to inventing marketing techniques. I mean, innovation is empowered. Is that what it looks like? Um, is it encouraged? And so... What this requires is embryonic access. You know, um, rather than being negative toward innovation, a truthful benchmark is one, a, a farm or food system, is one that actually embraces and encourages innovation. But you know, innovation is very disturbing. You don't have to read very many business books to find out innovation is very, very disturbing. Uh, and, and so change is scary. Uh, you know, we're hardwired not to like change. We're, hi we're hardwired to be negative. You know, somebody presents us an idea, ah, you know, it won't work, it won't work. That's, that, that, that comes naturally. I mean, that's why we call them stoplights and not go lights. We, you know, we, we concentrate. It, it, it's, it's easy to complain and say no and it won't work and whatever. Um, one of the most uh, famous ways to make sure the status quo stays the same is to create a bureaucracy. And so the bureaucr a, a bureaucracy is inherently non-innovative. So um, one of the ways that we've, you know, on our farm, we've developed this kind of a, a, an empowerment of innovation is with portable lightweight infrastructure. This kind of goes with, the, with the, the one before where we have lower capitalization costs and we use innovation with portable infrastructure. You know, uh, we have stuff today that grandpa would have given his eye teeth to head. You know, years ago, uh, I, I used to, you know, people would come to the farm and they'd, you'd hear these uh, stories would come back. You know, we went to this farm. It was like grandpa's farm. You know what? I get up on my hind legs and go crazy now when people uh, say that. I don't let them say this is like grandpa's farm. Grandpa, grandpa would have given his eye teeth for things like stainless steel, plastic pipe, water pumps, a, a little uh, a diesel powered uh, 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 four wheel drive tractor with a hydraulic, you know, loader on it, uh, a chipper shredder, um, uh, transit mixed concrete, uh, rural electrification, um, you know, water, uh, uh, potable water uh, pumped under pressure or, or gravity fed in, in a pipe. Um, these are all, I mean, nursery shade cloth. I mean, if you wanted to build a portable pastured chicken shelter uh, 80 years ago for 1,000 chickens, why, you couldn't have moved it with all the mules in the county because you'd have had to build it out of 8x8 eight eight, uh, uh, you know, timber frame construction because with the inefficient sawmills taking a quarter-inch kerf every, every cut, it was too inefficient to cut small stuff. The only really small stuff you could cut uh, was, was large uh, uh, rounds that you cut down with a with a, a fro, you know, a, a blade. You hammered it in, and a fro, and you wiggled it side by side. It was about, you know, and, and you and you could make lath, you know, like for hang, plaster and things like that. But but you simply couldn't make tinker toy style uh, wood today with bandsaw mills that that run on you know just a little Honda engine on a gallon of gas a day it takes a one tenth inch kerf, and you can mill all day, and it gives you a you know one wheelbarrow full of sawdust. We can now mill a thirty foot log into half inch by one inch lath for Tinker Toy portable shelters covered with shade cloth. I mean, this is cool. See, this is really cool. And that's, that's empowered innovation to try something new. I find it amazing today that right now, since January 1 of last year of 2013, now we're going on almost two years of this, one in every four pigs in the U.S. born has died from epidemic porcine viral diarrhea. Always got to have this nice big name. It's brand new, never had it before in the history of civilization. I've already decided if there's anything worse than diarrhea, it's got to be viral diarrhea. 
But these pigs are dying and it has the whole industry, you know, reeling. Oh no, what do we do? The pork prices are going up. And it's, it's, real, it's a real big problem. The only reason pork prices haven't gone up any faster than they have is because grain prices are falling. So we're not, we're not seeing that quite as, as drastic as we would otherwise. But the, the, the population is really under, under siege here. 25% of all baby pigs for the last two years, basically, have died. And you know what? I haven't heard one single scientist in the industry, nobody from the U.S. duh, nobody from the tax land grant universities, nobody has dared to ask, I wonder if we should put 10,000 pigs in one house. <laughs> you can't ask the question. See, because the orthodoxy, the orthodoxy of the day demands that that's the paradigm. And so a benchmark of truth is a food system that really embraces heretics and really embraces the lunatic fringe. See, a lot of people have the misnomer that in my community, you know, neighbor farmers kind of hang on the fence, look over there, you know, and, and say, oh, I wish I could have a farm like that. They don't. They call us bioterrorists. I was called a, a typhoid Mary. Because they really believe that our outdoor chickens are going to rub beak and waddle with an with a indigo bunny or a, or a, a, a robin who's then going to fly over to the Tyson chicken house and make all those birds sick. And the whole planet's going to starve to death and we can't feed the world because my chickens commiserated with a red-winged blackbird in our field, took it over to the science-based Tyson chicken house. That's the orthodoxy of the day. When we talk about an empowered innovation, I mean a system that actually does embrace, embrace out-of-the-box thinkers. People who have the audacity to say, you know, if I have a sick animal, could it be my fault? <laughs> I mean, the orthodoxy of is an animal gets sick, it's pharmaceutically disadvantaged. <laughs> I just haven't used the right stuff. Or if a, if a tomato has a fungus on it, well, I just didn't use the right chemical. Couldn't be because I didn't have the right soil or the right, you know, whatever. You know, it, it's got to be, you know, the 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 um, you know the, the chemical the chemical du jour, you know. And so, when I say empowered innovation, I mean empowered innovation. Let's just let's just be able to 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 um, experiment. Number six, number six. Benchmark of truth, the food and farming system should increase the commons, not decrease the commons. I call this, I call this my, my whosoever will clause. Whosoever will. In other words, if everybody did this, or could everybody do this? Is this open to everybody? What if everyone did this? What, what would things look like? And this is where I, I, I go down my, you know, rabbit trail of the need for ponds. If you're going to irrigate surface catchment ponds, back to P.A. Yeoman's Water for Every Farm, the Australian, um, ponds rather than aquifer or public water uh, irrigation. If you, you know, if we, if we for the last 70 years had taken all the money that's gone into Los Alamos in New Mexico and spin it instead using the bonanza of petroleum to carve high terrain catchments in all the valleys in New Mexico. Today, New Mexico would be drought proof and flood proof and would be in Eden. That's the truth. In fact, if you go there and ask people that study these kinds of things, they say that um, centuries ago, the place had tons and tons of beaver ponds. If you think about how many beaver ponds there were in the U.S. 600 years ago, we've got a long ways to go to bring back. And these were, these were not big TVA projects. These were... 
These were like, like, uh, like Bromfield, Lewis Bromfield said, the answer to the flooding in the Mississippi is not Army Corps of Engineer dams on the Mississippi. It's already too late. You got too much volume and velocity. The answer is millions and millions of farm ponds like, like big uh, giant cow uh, hoof prints up the, in the highlands all around to collectively decentralize the water and stop that uh, surface runoff and actually build the commons and hydrate the landscape and keep the base flow and the springs running in the summertime. And then you can irrigate from those strategically to use our big head and opposing thumbs, our, our, our creativity and our mechanical uh, prowess to uh, actually remediate the landscape and do a one investment in one in thousand years to rehydrate the landscape. That increases the commons. And it's totally different than sticking pumps and straws in rivers and aquifers that if everybody sucks, there's nothing there, eventually. If everybody sucks on the straw, I didn't want to meet. If everybody sucks on the straw, there eventually won't be any water there. I don't know what you guys are thinking about. Um, so what this means is that the truth is that our, our, our activity on the landscape should be fundamentally additive rather than extractive. Let me give you an example. I am, I'm not opposed to alcohol fuel, but I want you to consider what a difference it would be if we didn't have a Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms or Prohibition and hadn't had prohibition, and all the little stills were still allowed to exist, and that pesky little alcohol button on the Model T Ford were still in the dashboard of whatever today's Model T were. And instead of having huge um, government-subsidized, massive uh, alcohol plants, instead we had hundreds of thousands of little backyard outfits that were, t that were carefully integrated with a, an animal, perennial, annual, animal, manure, compost, carbon-centric rotation so that we had a democratized, decentralized kind of energy system. That is a whole different picture of alcohol fuel than a massive multi-million dollar plant that by gum, we built that, and you know what? Whether it depletes the soil, makes a dead zone the size of New Jersey and the Gulf of Mexico, impoverishes the neighborhood, or even if we don't need it, we're going to continue to use it because we built it. What happens is the bigger the toy, the bigger the emotional enslavement to use the toy. And if we have lots of little itty-bitty toys all scattered around, suddenly... It completely changes the model. Ultimately, increasing the commons is part of building the community. And so what we need is a neighbor-friendly system that runs on handshakes rather than legal documents. Fundamentally, it's one that runs on trust. One that runs on trust. Number seven. Number seven. Do I have time to finish? Am I okay? All right. All right. Number seven. Number seven. Benchmark of truth. Easy Entrance and exit. Easy entrance and exit. It's easy to get in and easy to get out. This is fundamental for preserving multi-generational successional uh, uh, types of things. This requires low capitalization. Think about it. If you want to, if you want to grow one chicken for Tyson, if you want to grow one chicken for Tyson, what's the first thing you've got to do? You've got to build a $500,000 confinement house. Folks, that's hard to get in. If you want to raise a direct marketed pastured chicken for your community, you can start with a little salvage lumber, almost no cost, uh, uh, portable shelter that you move around on the pasture. That's what I'm talking about. Low capitalization. This lowers the risk thresholds. How locked in are you to your paradigm? Being able to easily enter and exit. Think about a single use, uh, uh, you know, our, our single use capital intensive infrastructure denies fluidity in the system. 
I mean, think about it. Uh, uh, some, some young person, um, you know, goes off to a grass farming conference and learns how to, uh, how to, how to from a confinement dairy and learns how to grow uh, a, a grass-based dairy. Okay, we're going to, and, and the young person comes all back, all excited, you know, and says, and grandpa's, you know, coming out of the barn, she says, grandpa, grandpa, you know, it's, it's, it's the 18-year-old daughter, right? She desperately wants to farm, stay there on the family farm, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's tough these days with all the vet bills and the grain costs and, and, the, and the manure and the, and the skeletal, the, the, you know, the downer cows and the lack of fertility and, and you know, all the stuff that, 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 that economies of scale and orthodoxy create. And she says, hey, Grandpa, I went to this conference. You know what? We can just, we can, we can forget the silo, you know, the bankruptcy tube. Um, we, we, we can just, we can just, with a little bit of electric fence, we can let these cows just run out here in packs. We can move them every day from one paddock to another one. They will harvest their own feed. They'll fertilize it. We don't have to haul manure. They, they'll, they'll poop on the pasture, and, and they'll harvest it themselves. And, and, you know, and she gets to about to this point, and Grandpa says, what? Don't you understand? I spent my whole lifetime borrowing money, bending rebar, pouring concrete, building this dairy. And you just gonna, you just gonna walk away from all that? Whose child are you? And and that dear people is the trap, the danger of capital-intensive, highly depreciable, single-use infrastructure. That's the danger of it. Several years ago, we did an economic analysis on our farm. The average farm in America, it takes $4 worth of depreciable infrastructure. I'm not even talking about land here. I'm just talking about buildings and equipment. $4 worth of buildings and equipment to generate $1 in annual gross sales. That's the average in America. On our farm, you ready for this? It's 50 cents to a dollar. It's 800% difference. Folks, there's nothing to buy because our equity is in management, customers, and information. See? And you don't have to borrow that from a bank. And it's portable. And you can take it from one farm to the other. Suddenly now, you can divorce the farm from the land and you can move the farm around wherever you want to with these low capital, portable infrastructure. Easy to get in, easy to get out. Number eight, consistent across all fields, spiritual, ethical, economic, and ecological. The model has to be consistent. Let me give you a couple of examples. Think about multi-speciation. Multi-speciation. It's the ecological pattern. There is no monospeciation in nature. It's all multi-speciation. So it meets the ecological pattern. It's, it creates, multi-speciation creates economic synergy. When they say you can't feed the world your way, let me tell you something. The most rudimentary, novice, beginning, multi-speciated, multi-dimensional backyard garden is more productive per square yard than the most amazing Monsanto monoculture you can imagine. That's the truth. So you have economic synergy. And then what better way to accentuate the, 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 the religious or spiritual truth of, of allowing lots of different beings to express their, their unique gifts and talents in, a, in, in an ecosystem. So that's across all things. How about pigness of pigs? You know, you leverage the physiology of the pigs. Um, you know, uh, the animals do the work, you know, on, on our farm, the, the animals make the compost. You know, we call them piggerators. They, you know, they, they, they make all that compost. And then, and then by, by allowing the pigs to use the plow on the end of their nose and their innate pigness, their, their physiological leverage and animals doing the work instead of depreciable infrastructure doing the work, you know what, spiritually that means we're releasing the glory of the pig. See, if we're going to believe the golden rule, do unto others as you want them to do and be a good neighbor, good neighbors don't pollute the air, water, or, or send genetically modified beings to have an adulterous orgy in my fields where I don't want them. Ultimately, when we have a system that moves us toward faith 
rather than fear, it's a consistent benchmark of truth. Number nine, almost done. Number nine, a benchmark of truth is that it must be appropriate in both developed and undeveloped countries. It must be a viable model that works both in developed and undeveloped countries. This has come to me over time just slowly as I've had visitors from uh, Africa and, and, and uh, you know, Bosnia and, and other places and uh, lots of visitors over the years. And, and many times our farm is the only little excursion um, that they have into something other than what the other foundations that are paying for their trip are taking them to, which are, of course, Tyson chicken houses and that sort of thing. And from tribal chiefs to, to city mayors to whatever, they come and they look at what we've got and they just stop and they say, this is what our people need. And it has struck me over the years. Here we are in this, you know, sophisticated, techno-glitzy culture. And, and we believe that what we've got is incredibly viable. Uh, it is. Um, but it's, it's, it's incredibly affirming to know that it's, it's the most viable option for undeveloped peoples, for hungry peoples, for, for economically disadvantaged cultures. A Tyson chicken house is not nearly as, as appropriate when the annual wage and the, and the resource and the roads and the infrastructure, it's not appropriate. It's not appropriate here. It's not appropriate there for sure compared to, for example, pastured poultry. Now they've got to, they've got to make you know, certain adjustments like in China a guy that did it uh, built his egg mobiles big enough so he put a honeymoon suite in the back because their biggest problem was, was two-legged thieves and so they, they had the chickens in the front and a honeymoon suite in the back couple lived there in the summer and you know that was cool um, as, as security so you make you know, general adaptations but, but essentially the idea of, 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 um, of, of portable infrastructure where I could put, I could take all of the control electric uh, netting for chickens and pigs and cows on our farm and put it all in checked luggage and do and 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 control the uh, the, the stock that's running through the squat pots and the, and spreading typhus and everything in a in a in a, uh, in a village uh, in a third world country you know that can be done very simply, very cheaply. It's, it's very cool, very cool. Um, think about how much easier it is to build a compost pile than it is to, to, to depend on chemicals for, for fertility. When we have a local carbon-centric on-site self-reliance fertility program, suddenly that is not dependent on foreign places and, and, and uh, shipping in from other places. The answers are always from the inside out, not the outside in. And when we empower the inside out, it's appropriate in both developed and undeveloped uh, countries. Finally, number 10, benchmark of truth, it scales up as well as down. If it only scales down, I'm not sure it actually can feed the world. If it only scales up, then it's a pretty exclusive kind of program. It's not size discriminatory. Now, one of the ways to do this is to have animals do the work. So, you know, on our farm, we use the piggerators to turn the compost, all right? And, and that allows us to use appreciating infrastructure instead of, instead of having depreciating compost turners, petroleum and tractors, and all the labor to turn it. Instead, you know, we use pigs. All of them have a sign on their forehead that says, we'll work for corn. And so we just, we just put the corn in. It ferments under the cows tromping around on it. And then we put the pigs in. The pigs seek the fermented corn, and they aerate it and turn it. And, and all that turning is done, and then we spread it back on the fields. And the pigs are doing the work so we're using appreciating infrastructure that doesn't need their oil change they don't need spare parts they don't need minimum wage you know what a retirement program when you're done with them you eat them you know so so it's a it's a wonderful it's a wonderful recycling program it can be done as profitably. Here's the deal. The profit potential is size neutral because we haven't had to get enough volume to replace the things that rot, rust, and depreciate. Marketing. Um, 
it should, should be able to scale both directions. I mean, when you have a food model in which uh, only tractor trailers can come to the loading dock, that's a very, that's a very uh, only a scale up kind of program. I had the, the 10 uh, direct report VPs from Costco come to the farm a couple years ago, one of their little jaunts, and they were wondering, how do we get your kind of stuff at Costco? And, I, and so we had a nice tour, and, and as we were eating our little uh, uh, sack lunches there, uh, they asked me, I said, well, okay, so what do you think? You know, how can we get your kind of stuff in, in our, in our uh, place? And I said, well, for starters, um, you need a policy in which a truck, lo a, a truck smaller than a tractor trailer can back up to your loading dock. End of the discussion. They couldn't even conceive of a thing where a truck smaller than a tractor trailer could back up to their loading dock. So marketing needs to be scaled, you know, where we, where we can have small scale access. Uh, this will require, of course, uh, collaboration. I'm out of time, so I'm not going to elaborate on what we're doing with our uh, metropolitan buying clubs and our collaborative arrangements. But I'll, I'll just say this. I think that one of the ways to create scale is to use the Internet in Internet marketing, which doesn't require bricks, mortars, and cashiers, which have an inherent overhead built into them. So when we, when we, uh, when we aggregate electronically and maintain our inventory, inventory electronically, then we can actually create economies of scale. We can, we can move seamlessly up and down because, uh, because the, the internet and the website and a, and a shopping cart, an electronic shopping cart in aggregation is seamless whether you're very small or whether you're very large. That's a way to do it. Um, uh, insurance is, is a huge one, you know. Uh, I mean, we, we, it took us three years to get on a, um, on a truck to be able to service a VA hospital that wanted our, our, uh, our pork tenderloins. And, um, but in order to do that, you know, the first thing we had to do was to have $3 million worth of product liability. We've, we've got to start self-insuring. We've got to, this is a place where we really need to, need to work on, on something. You know, we, we tried to, we had a customer that wanted, on, wanted us on to be on a Cisco truck. So I, you know, Cisco, well, how do we get on a Cisco truck? He says, well, uh, I'll send you the protocols. I got 17 pages of, of requirements. And uh, the first one was that we had to uh, have a metal magnet that could pull uh, metal shards through 12 inches of ground pork or beef. Well, in our little community slaughterhouse that we happen to co-own, a little federal inspected facility with 18 employees, if we put a magnet that powerful in, all our workers would be stuck to it from their belt, you know, their big belt buckles. You know, they all NASCAR race guard guys. Uh, and, I mean, there wouldn't even be any place to put it in the plant, you know. Um, you know, mandatory chlorine. You know, when, when, uh, when I had one of the uh, representatives come down, uh, I asked her, I said, well, what if, we, what if we could show by empirical test that we don't even have the pathogens that you require chlorine to, to stop? There was this pregnant one-minute pause. She said, we never think about that. We just assume that, it's, that, the, that, that the product is toxic coming out the farm. It's either chemicalized, it's, it's, you know, it's pathogen, it's toxic, it's got salmonella, E. coli, whatever. That's the assumption. The idea that we could actually have clean food on a farm doesn't even cross their mind. And so the protocols, the SOPs, the GAPs, the insurance requirements, the underwriters, and all the handshake uh, backroom deals that they, that they agree on on the golf, golf course, um, is, 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 is prejudicial against small scale thing. And I'll conclude, I, I wouldn't be fair to myself or you guys if I didn't at least rail for a minute on why food safety regulations are so bad is because they all mandate infrastructure instead of empirical science to test. When we, when we were, when, when, when we've had our battles and battles and battles over the years, and it's amazing, these guys stand there, you know, and, and they say, well, you need, you need uh, you know, certain amount of light bulbs, and you need uh, a certain amount of stainless steel, and temperatures in your water, and that stuff, and, and we get our chicken tested at a lab, and we're 25 times cleaner than what's gone through all their protocol and gorged through 40 chlorine baths in the processing plant. <laughs> and, and, they, and they look at you and say, well, that's not all we're interested in. I said, well, what else are you interested in? Well, how many bathrooms do you have? Well, we're 50 feet from our house and mom's house. She's got two, I've got two, you know, we just... 
And, and if I want to go number one, I'll step behind the tractor and go right there. I mean, what are you going to do about that? I mean, do we want clean food or do we want to sell stainless steel and petroleum? You know, that's the question. If I can, if I can gut a chicken as clean in my kitchen sink as hits your benchmark, oh, oh, that's right. They don't have any benchmarks. You know, so I suggested to them, look, let's buy an R2D2 machine. We can just swab, stick it in there, and, uh, and, and you know, it, it's just empirical. Federal inspector says he thinks a minute. He says, hmm, yeah, that would work. But then... I'd be out of a job. No, I wouldn't be in favor of that. <laughs> so I find it amazing that we've come to the point in our culture where it's perfectly safe to feed your kids, you know, Twinkies, Cocoa Puffs, and Mountain Dew, but it's a hazardous substance to get or sell or buy or feed your kids raw milk and Aunt Matilda's homemade pickles and quiche and compost-grown tomatoes. That's pretty despicable. And so... You know, that's why I'm such a promoter of the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund, because I think that this, this whole processing food safety issue is becoming far, far worse, fast, better. I don't know if you're watching the Food Safety Modernization Act, uh, but, but they've already now uh, uh, ru uh, run down the, uh, the E. coli. You know, there are good E. coli and bad E. coli. We have E. coli inside us. You know, you got E. coli right there inside of you. You better be glad, because if you didn't, you couldn't digest your food. You know, we are 85% non-human. <laughs> Three trillion bacteria inside of us, and they're going to conferences and having school board meetings or whatever, you know. <laughs> I don't know if they're throwing bombs at each other or not. I think they do that when we send down some monosodium glutamate, you know, some unpronounceable something or other. You know, I'm on with Michael Pollan, you know, we probably shouldn't be eating anything that wasn't available before 1900. And, and we, we can all be thankful that hot dogs were developed in 1890 at the 1890 World's Fair. You know, just kind of. But the point is that we are not sterile beings. We're, we're, we're as Mark McAfee, the raw milk producer in, uh, in California says, we are bacterio sapiens. And if we could take an electron microscope over the room here, we'd see, you know, your breath in front of yours and yours, you know, and we're, I'm breathing what you just exhaled and who knows what the front road's getting here, you know. I mean, it's all over the place. It's in us, around us and all that, which is, which is why we need to have the freedom to be able to choose the food of our choice from the source of our choice. And if we had that, if we had a food emancipation proclamation in this country, in short order, all of us would put Tyson's out of business in a heartbeat. That's the truth. So, there you have the benchmarks of truth and they are evolving I'm not saying this is definitive, but it's something I've been thinking about as, as we look at trying to articulate what are, what are those, those practical things that you can look at, you, 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 can, you can measure and you can say, all right, this is right and this is not right. This is right, this is not right. And, and I think we all need to really uh, become idea and practical demonstration salespeople, marketers to our customers, our friends, our family to be able to articulate um, what it is that, that, that makes us different. We're, we're not the same. We're not Tyson. We're not just, you know, a, 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 a wacko movement. We are absolutely the heart and soul of an indigenous, truthful, honorable, sacred system. That's our repository. We're responsible for holding on to it. And I suggest that we're responsible for creating the legacy and keeping it going for our children and our children's children. Now, may all of your carrots grow long and straight. May your radishes be large and not pithy. May, uh, may tomato blossom end rot affect your Monsanto neighbor's tomatoes. <laughs> may the uh, coyotes be struck blind at your pasture chickens. May all of your uh, culinary experiments be palatably delectable. May the rain fall gently on your fields. The wind be always at your back. Your children rise and call you blessed. And may we all make our nest a better place than we inherited. Thank you so much for letting me visit with you. Thank you. Thank you.